Hello, my name's Richard and I'm the Clinical Programs Lead for Drinks and Giraffe. Um, this is the third video uh, in a series of videos around um, posture management through an occupational lens. So some of the aims of these um, this new video series are um, why functional seating and postural management is important for participation and engagement, uh, whether a lack of opportunity can limit or hinder children's development, We'll look at how um, occupational performance is related to postural management and taking a holistic and client-centered approach can enable independence, function and engagement. We'll also take a look at the ICF framework uh, and also a, the social model of disability. So in this video, we're gonna focus more on occupational models. So in particular, we're gonna be taking a look at the Canadian model of occupational performance and engagement. So what we hope to get out of today's video uh, is first of all, taking a look at what the uh, sorry Canadian um, model of occupational performance and engagement is, why it's different from other models um, and how we can use it to, to look at a person as a whole. Uh, we'll also look at how we can use that information to better inform uh, postural interventions and the equipment that we uh, decide to use. Um, we'll look at also two relating case studies um, using tricycles, so uh, Brady and Henry's stories, we'll take a look at that. Um, and we'll look at how correct postural management can create opportunities for inclusion, uh, sorry, inclusion, engagement and participation, and how these case studies also relate to the ICF and the, the F words. So the Canadian model of occupational performance and engagement, um, this is a um, a view of how it might look. So it's breaking a person down into different um, subsections, into three different domains. So we look at the person as a centre um, with, uh, you'll notice a big circle in the middle, spirituality, which we'll get on into in a second. Also looks at um, a person's occupation, so the things that they do in their lives um, and the environment that they, they do that within. So if we start breaking this all down so it makes a bit more sense, um, if we take a look first of all at the, the term spirituality, which you'll notice was at the centre of the person. So that is the the one um, thing within this model that um, really differentiates it from any other um, um, occupational model um, that is, is kind of available. So spirituality doesn't necessarily mean religion, um, as a lot of people interpret that to mean. Uh, it can um, re relate to um, religion, but it's basically the core values of that person. It's the essence of self, um, it's often referred to as. So what um, that person lives to in regards to their moral co code or how they live their lives in terms of fundamental um, uh, being and also uh, what's important to them at, at the centre. Uh, like I mentioned, this could be through religion, um, but it could be through a whole um, kind of ream of things of how we like to live our lives day to day or the code that we live by. Um, so like I mentioned, it's the first framework that acknowledges that as the core um, um, of a person in terms of human occupation. Um, and this can this is often expressed as well the spirituality side of things in um, how we actually engage and perform our own occupations as well. So I'm just going to mention as well at this point in terms of the um, Canadian model of occupational performance and engagement or CMOP. Um, it's um, there is a an outcome measure that goes along with this model called the Coppen. Um, and this can actually only be used for people over the ages of eight years old um, or with the uh, cognitive ability of um, someone that is over eight years old. So I just want to point out at this stage that we're using this model as a way to break someone's um, someone down so that we can understand them better, not so much that we're using that particular outcome measure. Um, Okie dokie. So if we look at the person side of things um, further. So we have the spirituality in the middle and then on the, the three points of the triangle we have cognitive. So that means how we think, um, how our ability to think and communicate. Um, um, affective, so that's to do with our feelings of uh, the emotions that we go through day to day. And the physical side of things, so the doing, so the more physical parts of our body and um, and how we're able to actually do the occupations that we, we want and need to do. So if anything within this realm, anything in this three subsections of cognitive, affective, 
uh, um, or physical, if there's any impairments uh, within this, we need to understand what they are um, and how they affect someone's ability to engage in occupations or in the activities that they need or want to do. Um, um, and having those kind of three subsections makes it far clearer to see uh, the barriers around, um, around those issues. Um, if you look to the next section that, um, that covers the, the circle around the person is our occupations. So in the first video, we kind of defined what occupation was. So um, just to make it very kind of um, simple um, idea of what occupation is, is the things that we need, want or expected to do in life. Um, so again, they've broken this down into three subsections. Um, self-care being one of them. So all those personal activities of daily living that we need to do, like eating, feeding, toileting, using the bathroom, our gross and fine motor skills, our strength, um, all of that enable to look after ourselves. The productivity side, so th those kind of relate as well to um, the things that we need to do in life as well, those kind of purposeful occupations of going to work or going to school, engaging in education, the shopping, domestic cleaning, um, that sort of thing. And then the leisure side of things is more of our meaningful occupations of what we enjoy to engage in um, in our lives or what things that are maybe our hobbies, socialising, but also, also this can include what's really important to us and kind of some of our life goals, that sort of thing. Um, um, as well as is encapsulated within that. And then the third and final section um, is the environment that uh, we do all of our occupations within. So this can be, again, broken down into the physical uh, environment. So the actual buildings of our home, school, um, workplace, uh, sports and leisure centres, places of worship. So how that is actually set up um, um, physically. Socially as well, so the people that are around us, our environment around us, our family, our friends, teachers, staff, uh, healthcare professionals, um, people that are kind of assisting with our life um, in that way. Cultural, so this might be kind of a religious um, culture or community groups that we're in, um, can include nationalities and ethnicities as well of um, how that differs. And then institutional, so that's kind of the healthcare um, organisations, um, work organisations and the government and kind of the legislation side of things that we're um, bound to. So what I kind of, what I didn't mention in the, the, per, uh, the person section, which is the same, uh, sorry, the occupation section, which is the same as the environment. So if there are barriers in, in any of these subsections as well, we can identify them and break them down easier um, by um, seeing how it affects the different parts of, of a person. So in this instance, the physical side of things, if uh, the environment at school isn't set up correctly, it's going to impact how someone can engage in their occupations. So as we can see, we've got that um, uh, slide again in front of us of how we it's all built together. Um, so from kind of finding out and assessing all of these different subsections, we're getting a very good picture of someone um, and a more holistic approach to, to an assessment or to the care of this person. Um, and we can find out where the barriers are um, and what is impacting those barriers and how they all interact with each other. Um, and then on the, the right side of the slide, you can see how um, we have overlap with the person, um, occupation and environment. And where those overlap, that's kind of called the occupational domain, um, occupational therapy domain, and that's where occupational therapy can happen where, when they over, overlap. So we'll come back to, to the model um, and how it can be used uh, when we look at the, the case studies. Um, but just before we, we do that, um, if we think about uh, postural management and how the um, the CMOP uh, e can can better inform us of that. If we have all of the, that information and we have got to know the child um, better, it's going to help to better inform our assessment and also our intervention. So um, knowing what occupations, for example, the child needs to complete in the day or what they want to complete may direct us in, in what um, piece of equipment um, they're going to require or what kind of accessories um, they they may need um, and how we're going to promote 
that engagement and participation by using this intervention of a piece of equipment. Um, and by managing a, a child's posture correctly, um, as the previous um, series of videos around postural manageable kind of inform you further, it can actually help uh, a child engage better because of the way that their body structure is, is also set up. It also can increase independence uh, in terms of self-care as well. If a, if a child isn't capable of um, sitting to brush their teeth, um, perhaps by managing a child's uh, posture, so all they need to think about is one arm, for example, and reaching it to, to their mouth, they might be able to be more independent in engaging in that self-care um, of brushing their teeth. Um, but also using this model, we're not just assessing the individual child, we're also assessing everything that's around them, their entire environment. So whether that's the physical environment around them, taking a look at their social and support networks of how to integrate that into, um, into their care uh, and also how to better aid that in independence and engagement. Also thinking as well about the roles of, of that individual as well. Um, we all have roles in uh, in life. Could be in terms of family roles. They they might be a son, daughter, siblings. How does that relate to them engaging in in their occupations and also engaging as a family member? And how our um, how our interventions can can assist with that. Okay, so the first um, case study that we're going to look at, we're going to meet Harry. So Harry is uh, eight years old. He loves going to school. Uh, he loves playing with his friends and visiting parks with his family. So Harry has um, hemiplegic cerebral palsy and GMF CS level two. He's also deaf and nonverbal. Um, he's got a cochlear implant and uses his iPad um, um, as a way of communication with simple language um, uh, as well to communicate. Uh, Harry has weakness through his left side of his body um, and can tire over long distances uh, when mobilising. So if we um, take a look at the um, CMOP as well, um, we're not going to go through this entirely, uh, but just to give you an idea of how it could be used, um, we can look at limitations um, um, with within kind of uh, Harry in terms of engaging in the activity of riding a tricycle as that's what this case study was around. Um, so if we take a look at the person, physically we we understand that um, he has cerebral palsy and a weakness on his left side and he tires over long distances. So these are some impairments that we need to be aware of when um, assessing and when uh, what ha it helps us to manage also expectations of, of, of what to look for and but also being aware not to be limited by that, um, but just uh, having an awareness of, of what Harry may need during the assessment. In terms of his cognition, um, he is uh, definitely non-verbal, so needs to use communication aid. Um, in terms of his occupations, we know that he loves um, going to school and playing with his friends. Uh, it's a very meaningful thing for him um, to do that and to go uh, to parks with his family. Um, in terms of his self-care, as I, I wasn't involved in in, um, in this case study, I'm not too sure, but that's something that you would, would go into in terms of how um, he meets his um, activities of daily living. And then in terms of his environment, for example, we'd look at um, school being a big factor. Um, so physically, the school, how it's set up, is there adaptations in place? Is it purpose-built? Is it converted? Um, how we can, uh, how's he going to access the playground? Uh, what are the barriers preventing him to do this? Um, there's just a few kind of examples of certain things we're going to, we would uh, be looking at using this model. So as you can see, we can start building up a picture of, of, of Harry holistically. And also we're not focusing on his disability. We're focusing on the occupation of riding a tricycle and what he wants to do and how he's going to achieve that. Um, and how his impairments, how they're, what the barriers are around that in terms of the school, uh, but also in terms of what he may need to support him to do so. So we're also going to meet Brady as well, who's also um, was taking part in the uh, this tricycle trial. So 
Um, he's again eight years old. He loves playing with his friends at school. He enjoys put- uh, computer games. Um, so Brady has um, spastic quadriplegia, um, cerebral palsy, and a GMF CS level of five. He's also non-verbal and uses an iPad to communicate, um, to aid his communication and understanding. Uh, he requires assistance to meet his um, activities of daily living. Um, he's got weakness and tone throughout his whole body um, and uses a manual uh, wheelchair, which the carer requires to assist for all his mobility needs. Um, and he uses a full body uh, posterior support wa- walking frame as well uh, when he's mobilising. So again, we can take a look at the uh, the model um, of the different things th- um, that um, could uh, affect uh, Harry's ability, um, sorry, Brady's ability. So again, we, we understand his physical condition. So uh, having spastic quadriplegia, we know that he's got weakness throughout his whole body and how that's maybe, um, um, <clears throat> how it might impair his ability to use a tricycle. Um, and also that he has the label of the GMFCS uh, level five, which um, uh, typically um, a person with that um, kind of label wouldn't be able to engage with tricycles. Um, so it may limit his opportunity to do so. But in this uh, case study, that wasn't, that was kind of taken into consideration. The opportunity was still given. Um, in terms of his communication, his cognitive side of things, we know again that he's got the iPad. So he's going to be able to need that to um, to communicate to, to staff and to other people around him. Similar with his um, environment in terms of his, um, of where he's going to be um, using the tricycle at school. So we need to know about the building and the accessibility again. Um, and we know in terms of his occupations, what's important to him, playing video games, um, being with friends. But we also know that he requires uh, full assistance for, for his ADLs, for example. So again, we're just painting a fuller picture of of Brady um, rather than just taking a look at what his um, diagnosis is, what he should and shouldn't be able to do, and just kind of going from there. Okay, so in terms of the actual case studies themselves, just to give you an overview of, of what was entailed. So like I mentioned, I was I was not involved in the case study. Um, the, the children's physiotherapists um, um, alongside with a coll- alongside a colleague of mine, um, um, actually completed the the case study. So, for for the the two boys, you can see um, this was um, what was set up. So for for Harry, um, the Rifton Adaptive Tricycle was used after a, a full assessment of his needs and and the supports that were individualised to him. Um, so this worked alongside Harry's existing therapy routine over a four week period. Um, we had 20 to 30 minutes of moderate, moderate intensity cycling three to five times a week. Uh, the intensity was measured through a uh, sports watch as well, and it was aiming um, between 50 to 70% of Harry's max heart rate. So again, with Brady, um, he was fully assessed for the um, equipment and accessories that he would need for a rift and adaptive tricycle. And again, using um, Brady's um, uh, existing therapy routine. It was this one was over a six week period again with a 20 to 30 minutes of moderate intensity of cycling and it was up to five times a week and the intensity was determined through the therapist's assessment and discretion. So the in terms of the outcome measures and what was what was tested it was all along the um, guidance of the UK Chief Medical Officer's Physical Activity Guidelines for Disabled Children and Disabled Young People 2022, as well as the Exercise and Physical Activity Recommendations for People with Cerebral Palsy. So I'm now going to just um, play you a video of of a part way through this case study of of Harry and Brady so you can have a little bit of an understanding of, of what happened.
So it's quite clear to see some of the um, kind of improvements um, and some of the effects of, of this trial. Um, just to kind of make uh, everybody watching aware, the, the two boys didn't know each other um, prior to the commencement of the study. They were in different classrooms um, and it's, you can kind of see just how quickly they uh, they got on and how um, they were interacting with each other. It was just quite lovely to watch. Um, so the, the I mean the benefits of that in terms of developing social skills through play. Um, we mentioned kind of the benefits of friendship, especially in the previous video. Um, but it's it's kind of great to see that development as as well through this physical activity. Obviously, gross motor skills developed. Um, so we're going to go on to breaking down exactly kind of which what what developed in with each each of the children. Coordination and balance as well improved spatial and bodily um, awareness. Obviously, you can tell that they're both um, absolutely loving uh, loving the tricycles and playing with each other uh, just through, uh, first of all, visually, uh, but also they use their communication aids to kind of relay that back to staff as well. So in terms of kind of the mental health and well-being improvements as well, um, in terms of, of <coughs> the engaging and participating in the, um, in the occupation of, of using the tricycle. So Harry, um, so after he's, after four weeks using um, the, the trike, he was able to get on and off the trike independently. He's able to push off independently, steer independently around the painted playground racetrack. And he also propels the tricycle very fast. So on the start of the four weeks, he wasn't able to do this. And, and this is what he's now able to achieve. His resting heart rate um, went from 81 beats per minute to 75. Um, his paediatric balance scale improved from 44 over 56 to 50 over 56. Uh, he's able to pedal and steer completely independently now. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the kind of the well-being side of things and in the engagement side of things, he feels more included as he's able to now cycle with his friends during break time. Um, but also how he really loves to ride the trike fast as uh, he loves chasing the staff uh, member around the playground as well. So after Brady's six weeks of using the tricycle, um, he was able to push off and pedal the trike independently, uh, turn the trike independently on wider turning circles, and he also joined cycling groups with his peers at break time. So initially he was really struggling with the independent pedaling and turning, uh, and he's currently working really hard on, on improving that. Um, so, but he's improved function so much so that he's now being referred for a powered wheelchair assessment. So, I mean, the, the impact on his own independence and being able to do that and mobilise himself will, will just be uh, incredible. So hopefully that will is something that Brady's going to be able to head towards. That'd be fantastic. Um, his mum said he, um, sorry, his mum said uh, she's never seen Brady cycle. And in truth, she didn't believe that it would be possible to. Um, He's always happy using his tricycle and he uses his communication aid daily to ask the ask staff at school um, to ride his trike. So just to summarise this, uh, the case studies using the kind of the F words from the ICF framework, which again, we did go through in quite a bit of detail in the previous video. So if you haven't seen that one, please do take a look. Um, so in terms of his fitness, or oh, sorry, um, Harry's fitness especially, we kind of measured that through an improved cardiovascular performance measured by his beats per minute. Um, having uh, their body, uh, body structures managed in such a way allowed them to engage with the tricycle. So by managing their posture correctly, um, uh, the, the children were able to, to use the tricycle um, effectively. They're able to engage in the activity as well, um, which again, allows for independence whilst using the tricycle. And as the um, studies progressed, they became more and more independent and was able, were able to do more for themselves, as well as engage with their friends uh, in participating, participating in cycling um, at break times. Uh, they're both clearly having lots of fun, which is great. Um, uh, and they both communicated this with their, their um, communication aids, but visu uh, visually having lots of fun. Uh, so working in co-production with uh, school staff, family, physiotherapists, uh, they're able to gain better outcomes for uh, for the child. 
So just to summarise uh, this video and, and the series, um, so using the um, Canadian model of occupation and engagement, we can focus on more of a child-centred uh, holistic practice. So we can understand that the child more, um, relate that to the, the barriers that are in place more and how they can be broken down uh, in order for the child to engage better in their occupations. Um, so identifying barriers through co-production as well, so not um, focusing everything on just uh, the child and the disability, but their wider environment, um, their social environment, family, um, uh, the people that are, are also around the child and involved with their care. So we're thinking outside of the biomechanical framework as well. Um, so we're focusing on inclusion, engagement and participation. So focusing less on how something's supposed to be done uh, traditionally and focusing more on how um, why it's being done and why it's important and um, making sure that it's not necessarily having to be done perfectly uh, but thinking of more of a functional approach. So we also saw throughout the, the presentations how um, correct and appropriate postural management can enhance independence as well and we relate that to the ICF framework and the F words um, and, and how this has kind of been, been achieved. And finally, um, just to reiterate those three main aims of postural management that we're, we went through a lot of detail in the previous, um, in the previous uh, video series around minimising damage, reducing energy expenditure, and this series, which was mostly um, focused on the function part of it. Um, so I hope this has been useful, um, and I hope um, um, you can use some of this information um, going forward or relating it to your interventions or, um, or assessing um, a child's needs.